The important thing is not the building. The important thing are the people. And people oftentimes evolve and change and move on. And yet, within that fabric of Jewish people, there's always a sense that we have to maintain our Yiddishkeit. Jewish survival, Jewish revival, may have as many interpretations as the Talmud. And certainly, synagogues sustain Jewish strength and community. But time and circumstance, certainly for American Jews, bring reluctant acceptance that often, for myriad reasons, the temples do not remain. The buildings may still stand, but the special sanctuary they gave, the comfort and serenity, is gone except in fond memories and one soul. So it is now with Shara Tikva B'nai Zion. just isolated to us or Chicago, it's a national problem. And you have people and, and synagogues just kind of shrinking and getting smaller, and there's only room for a certain amount of synagogues in any given area. You have a facility, you have staff, a rabbi, and once you get to a certain break-even kind of point in terms of membership, um, once you start losing money, then a decision has to be made to, to either merge or, or, or shut down. The prevailing uh, wisdom was that we're, we're spending our money, we're spending money that could be better spent other ways than trying to res resurrect, in essence, a congregation that was dying, that was dying. You know, deciding to wind things up, uh, you know, at, at a congregation is a very emotional, very difficult thing. When numbers become fewer, it's also important to say, how can we maintain and continue our faith? Faith doesn't end for congregants of a temple that is no longer active. Neither does the culture it nurtured. Shara Tikva B'nai Zion has closed. But its history, the legacies, will always be honored and the contribution to Jewish life revered. For those members at the end, the meaning of Dayenu, sung at the Passover Seder, may be fitting for what they no longer have. That alone would have been enough. For that alone we are grateful. B'nai Zion was founded in Rogers Park in 1917. The first B'nai Zion synagogue had been an Episcopal church St. Paul by the Lake at 1715 West Lunt. There was a need for people coming from the west side of Chicago to the north side, which is where all the new uh, migration was going. It was new, it was vibrant, it was different from their parents' type of neighborhoods, and basically different than their parents' type of Judaism. Rob Packer celebrated his bar mitzvah at B'nai Zion. He's written important histories about Chicago synagogues. Doors of Redemption, Forgotten Synagogues of Chicago, and a second book, Chicago's Forgotten Synagogues. And now we're talking about people that came of age of World War I, just before, and between the years of World War I and World War II. And so starting in uh, the house of uh, Joseph Friedman, a group of 10 families got together and started Congregation B'nai Zion. The B'nai Zion founders and first officers were Herman Spivak, President, Joseph Friedman, Vice President, Herman Friedland, M. Van Gelder, Philip Klafter, Rabbi A. L. Lassen, Edward Steef, Nelson C. Stein, and Leo M. Waldman. In September 1928, 
B'nai Zion's magnificent new synagogue, designed by Edward Steinberg, was dedicated at 1447 West Pratt. It was the first synagogue and first conservative temple in that then growing dynamic neighborhood. Abraham Lassen was the rabbi and would serve longer than any other at B'nai Zion. In time, more than a thousand families were members. Another rabbi instrumental in B'nai Zion's growth was Henry Fisher. Serving from 1945 to 1964, Rabbi Fisher led funding efforts for construction of the adjacent Wolberg Community and Educational Center. I didn't get there until 1932. And my family moved into Rogers Park and uh, we, my family joined B'nai Zion and of course I went to Hebrew school there, Bar Mitzvah there, and uh, went to the war. And when I came back from the World War II, uh, I was married by that time and we lived in Rogers Park right not within walking distance of the synagogue. We've actually we lived on, we lived on um, Ashland Avenue, just about three blocks or so from the synagogue. And uh, we raised all our children. And they all went to B'nai Zion and Bar Mitzvah there and so forth. We had three boys, so they were all Bar Mitzvah there. We were three and a half blocks from the shoal. Um, my kids went to Hebrew school there. Their regular school was across the street, so that was really convenient. Um, and um, af after their bar mitzvahs, they all continued and, and had Hebrew high school. B'nai Zion had a, an active USY, United Synagogue Youth. That's uh, the youth group oh, okay. for, for after uh, bar mitzvah. And uh, the kids all, you know, they belonged to that and enjoyed it. The men's club had uh, every Sunday morning either a speaker or, or something, followed by a breakfast, and the bar mitzvah kids would, jo you know, the, the USY would join them for the breakfast. And the sisterhood was active. Um, there were classes um, at various times. Dr. Linda Gruenberg was married at B'nai Zion. Her daughter, Corinne, had her bat mitzvah there. The rabbi was Norman Kleinman. The congregants were uh, very uh, warm and welcoming and it made you feel very comfortable. And uh, what was really nice also was it certainly it was a very traditional conservative congregation that I was used to with what I had grown up with. And so the services were very familiar to me, certainly, and that was important to me. On high holidays, you know, as the sun is setting, that's when you know that the, you know, the, the, the sun is streaming through those beautiful stained glass windows and the feeling that you just get from being in that sanctuary and, and just the, the generations that had been there before. It was, it was just a, a, a marvelous experience. B'nai Zion was like the, was the place. It was it. If you were going to temple, if you were going to be a successful middle, upper middle class Jew, and you wanted you wanted your congregation to present that type of faith. B'nai Zion was, was it. B'nai Zion was the Esther place of synagogues. The congregants of Sheret Tikva may very well have felt that theirs was the Esther place of synagogues. Sheret Tikva would eventually become one of the largest synagogues, certainly conservative temples, in Chicago. The main sanctuary of the synagogue at 5800 North Kimball Avenue in the Hollywood Park neighborhood had a seating capacity of 1,227. Family membership by the late 1950s would exceed 1,000. Carol Gutstein remembers the scene on the high holidays. It was large and there were a lot of people there and it was like it was the place to be there were 
police on horses to keep the people together because there were so many people. Shartikva was where it was at. It was full on the high holidays. And they had so many people there, they had Andy Frayn ushers controlling the crowd in the building. Police, ushers, crowd control, those days were very different from Sharatikva's beginnings. A small storefront structure in the 3300 block of West Bryn Mawr Avenue was the congregation's first building. The congregation was officially established October 19, 1942 by 65 charter members under the name North Park Congregation. These are first generation whose parents were immigrants <clears throat> and they worked very hard and they had businesses and they were dedicated to Judaism and they were dedicated to have their children grow up Jewish and there was a community, a neighborhood, a climate where it was so important to keep a sense of Judaism not in the old sense of Eastern Europe, but in the new sense of America, where there was so much opportunity, so much ability to overcome whatever the prejudices were in Europe. The first rabbi was Mordechai Waxman, who came to the congregation as more storefront buildings were added on Bryn Mawr to accommodate the growing Hebrew school. Friday night and Saturday services were often held in the Peterson School Auditorium and high holiday services at North Park College. The synagogue's name became the North Park Sheratikva Congregation and later was changed to Sheratikva, which means the Gates of Hope. In 1947, ground was broken for the new synagogue, community center, and school at Kimball and Ardmore. Morris Gutstein was the rabbi and led the fundraising for the new buildings. His son, ophthalmologist and rabbi, Neftali Gutstein, who was married by his father at Sheratikva, remembers that time well. The building originally uh what just contained the, uh, when it was built, contained the, uh, the, school, the school building and the synagogue, the auditorium was added uh, a bit later, quite a, uh, a number of years later. And this is uh, a far cry from what it was when it was uh, in a couple of stores on Bryn Mawr Avenue. Until the sanctuary building opened in 1953, religious services were in the new community center's listener hall. The synagogue's dedication ceremonies and cornerstone placement were part of a three-day celebration. Morris Gutstein had come to Sheratikva from the Humboldt Boulevard Temple. Before that, he was rabbi at the historic Toro Synagogue in Newport, Rhode Island. The Toro Synagogue was the first synagogue in America. Rabbi Gutstein wrote a book about the synagogue wherein he noted the trap door under the bima used by the Underground Railroad during the Civil War and for escape dating back to before the Revolutionary War. The Toro Synagogue is designated a National Historic Site. Rabbi Gutstein was a famous scholar and writer of Jewish history. He would be the longest serving rabbi at Sheratikva. His books and the reputation that preceded his work in Chicago brought another special aspect to what had already grown into a very special synagogue. Rabbi Gutstein's religious and spiritual leadership was extraordinary in many ways. His other son is attorney and rabbi Solomon Gutstein. My father's feeling was it's not right to have a single table and to have your back to the ark. And that's not right because that's the holy section. You don't turn your back on something holy and special. So he redesigned the bima, spreading it across the entire front of the shul, and on one side was the cantor, on the other side was the rabbi, each with their own little table, 
and the Torah would be read from one or the other side, so the middle was completely open. And the result was that never at any point in services was the rabbi or the cant or any participants back faced to the ark. My father-in-law was the mainstay of that synagogue for a long time. Photographer Neil Handelman is a former president of Sheratikva. He joined there in 1968. Rabbi Gutstein was the rabbi, and Murray Lind was a very famous uh, cantor. He was wonderful. He was one of the Lind brothers, and they had a good choir. They, they had the choir at that time on Friday nights, sometimes Saturday, high holidays especially. In fact, when I first came, the first time on a high holidays, they had four services. We couldn't get into the main service. It was completely filled up. We got into one of the downstairs services. When I first came to Shari Tikva in the late 60s, there were so many bar mitzvahs. They would have two for Shabbos morning. They'd have one or two. The girls would be Friday night. They would have a mincha service for one or two kids. It was just, it, it was like a factory. They kept having so many bar and bat mitzvahs. It was really continuous. Jewish education was always paramount at Sheratikva. There was Sunday school as well as Hebrew school. And it was very common for young adults to continue studies after their bar and bat mitzvahs. Adult education thrived as well. Over and above the religious services, the Sheratikva calendar was always full. Like B'nai Zion, like so many other synagogues, Sheratikva, at its zenith, offered rich cultural opportunities through the men's club, sisterhood, Hadassah, and other venues. They had early on a forum series. Uh, I remember there were about four or five, once a month, four or five programs which were unusual in, in content. Uh, I remember specifically meeting Eleanor Roosevelt when she was one of the speakers there. And I remember listening to Yudu Menuhin. It was an unbelievable kind of cultural program. In addition to that, they had social groups. Uh, same age couples raising children of the same age, and they would get together socially. And that happened continually, even once the children grew up. The, these people, many of them are passed away now, but it was just a really wonderful thing that, that it wasn't just a religious community, it was a social community, and uh, they were very good friends. Neil Handelman's family was involved with one of those social groups. They were referred to as chevras. We had probably about 10, 12 families. We used to have a meeting once a month, either a speaker or some function. We became very close. We, we went to each other's kids bar mitzvahs and everything we did and we ran different functions for the synagogue. So it, it became our family. Shara Tikva was famous for its stained glass windows. There were 30 windows unlike any other in the world. The artist, A. Raymond Katz, designed the windows based on Morris Gutstein's vision that they depict Judaism in art. This is the Yom Kippur window. The Sabbath window. Rosh Hashanah. Here is the Passover window the Hanukkah window. Katz created balcony windows symbolizing the five books of Moses in more abstract form. Dedication ceremonies for the windows were in 1960. The windows became an attraction bringing visitors of all faiths to share a tikva. And I remember my father saying he never realized that there could be so many designs to cover the theories and the items in the holidays. And I remember Katz saying to my father, he never realized there was so much to put in that he had to have designs about. 
The result was that the windows themselves became like a journey through Judaism, much, much more involved and much more substantive than any of the other windows I've ever seen anywhere. They're beautiful. Solomon Gutstein would help his father write a book about the windows. It was filled with Jewish historical perspectives, often exemplified through the Gutstein family genealogy and its long line of rabbis. When Morris Gutstein became rabbi emeritus in 1971, there was already concern about the long-term future of the synagogue because the dynamics of change really never go away. Shira Tikva knew that well when the once huge membership at the Albany Park Hebrew Congregation closed that shul and merged with Shira Tikva in the late 1960s. A 1992 video made for Shara Tikva's 50th anniversary was more a recruiting program than a celebration. To stay alive, we need to bring in new members. And so we need to look for very creative ways of reaching out into our community and involving people in the synagogue. We need young people. We need the advice and counsel of older people, but we need the uh, physical strength <laughs> and spirit of young people. If you have good people uh, and you're offering good things, then other people will come. The future of women, uh, Shari Tikva, is the sky's the limit. But the dynamics of change kept coming. They saturated the 80s and 90s. And by the turn of the century, B'nai Zion faced the reality. Then, of course, everything started to hit the wall in the mid-70s. And, you know, slowly and slowly, B'nai Zion, we went through a number of rabbis. Uh, and over the last 10 years, roughly late 90s, mid-90s to the early 2000s, B'nai Zion just about ceased to exist. B'nai Zion held its final services in June 2002, with 80 families remaining from what once was the oldest continuously operating conservative synagogue in Chicago. In a final message to the congregation, the rabbi, Michael Shoren, quoted the Yiddish proverb that translates, the heart is small and embraces the whole wide world. He wrote, I know that many of your hearts are filled to the breaking point. For all of you, who have been loyal members for many, many years, my heart goes out to you. The merger in 2002 with Shara Tikva proved the best option and a complete shutdown was averted. Karen Berkeley, a one-time president at Shara Tikva, was involved in the merger planning. It was just a wonderful merger, just, just wonderful. I remember I went to B'nai Zion because I wanted to see it. I'd never been there, and it was just like the day before it was closing. And I couldn't believe what a beautiful edifice it was. It was as beautiful as the synagogues in old Europe. And the, the fact that this community that had been there since the 1920s had to leave that beautiful building, I cried. I'm going to cry now. I stood there and I cried. But I saw that these people were still interested in, you know, being a community and realizing that they, they did now have to merge. And it was just a wonderful marriage between the two synagogues. And uh, it, was, it was a wonderful happening. B'nai Zion was an egalitarian synagogue. Sherry Tikva B'nai Zion was, Sherry Tikva was before we got there, an egalitarian. That was a very important component in looking for a synagogue to merge with. Um, uh, women being involved in the service on the BIMA was a very, very important component. The merger strengthened the combined congregants. The future looked brighter. And once we had the merger with B'nai Zion, things started all over again. Even though they were older, but they had experience for many years having a, a, a good uh, men's club and a good sisterhood. And uh, even until the very end, we had a good sisterhood. There was another reason for the renewed confidence that Shara Tikva B'nai Zion was going to succeed. 
Rabbi Dennis Katz. He was instrumental in bringing the two temples together. Dennis was an incredible person. The amount of knowledge that he had uh, was incredible. We were surprised when we first hired him that he had never been a pulpit rabbi before. But he took to it very well. Uh, his sermons were amazing. And he liked to do things that were slightly different. It was Rabbi Katz who encouraged Jack Reese to become the temple's cantor. And that was slightly different. The first time I did the holiday services was an absolute disaster. Off key, I couldn't come in with the music, the little things, the few things that the choir would actually let me do. Um, made a lot of mistakes. Dennis Katz gave me a lot of music to learn from tapes that uh, he had gotten. He had a good ear for tapes. This is Brad Fisher and his daughter Lilia in a photo used in a Shara Tikva B'nai Zion Hebrew School brochure. When Brad brought his other daughter, Chloe, into Dennis Katz's office, around the time Brad was considering joining Shara Tikva B'nai Zion, he knew he was choosing right. Rabbi and I are speaking, and I, I, he had a, a wonderful office where people would meet and talk all the time, and there were a couple of couches there. And I looked over, and uh, Chloe was jumping up and down on, on one of his leather couches. And uh, you know, I made her stop, and I, I apologized to, to the rabbi. And he looked at me and he said, we need more kids around here jumping on couches. <laughs> and that was, that was his attitude. When a Chicago philanthropist funded a program to get first-time campers to overnight Jewish summer camp, he turned to Dennis Katz and Todd Bodenstein. In 2006, they created and helped grow what is called One Happy Camper into a nationwide program currently serving 40 cities. It provides grants to help over 10,000 campers each year to attend any Jewish summer camp of their choice. Rabbi Katz was very much a businessman. Really, you needed to be to lead a congregation that faced so many challenges. Promoting the Hebrew school was a key strategy to gain younger families. So was a story in the online Chicago Jewish News in September 2005 detailing Shara Tikva B'nai Zion's drive for new members. But then the rabbi faced his own personal challenge, and that changed everything. It was because of this level of knowledge in, in business that we were moving in the direction we were. So when he developed cancer and was no longer able to be active in uh, helping direct us with the business and also part of it, and then we lost him, we, not that we couldn't do these things on our own, but we lost a very important component, if you will, of our planning process and our execution process in making the change. So this was a very unusual, unique situation that we ended up in. That planning process Dr. Gruenberg mentioned included a number of ideas and approaches for building up the Shara Tikva B'nai Zion membership. The prodigious efforts, however, couldn't bring the hoped-for results. Sher Tikva, like other synagogues, whether they were on Maxwell Street or later on the west side or on the south side or in the south shore, they were constantly changing because of circumstances, because of conditions. And Sher Tikva was going through the same situation. The children of the children who are now third generations 
we're moving from the north side and the south side and moving to the suburbs, whether it was Skokie, Wilmette, and other communities. People who would come on high holidays, and I would see them only on the high holidays, they came to Shartik because that's where they got married, that's where their kids were bar mitzvahed, that's where their kids went to Hebrew school. You know, it, it, there was a certain, uh, affili a certain feeling that Shari Tikva is my second home. And every Rosh Hashanah and high holidays, you would see the same people and always with the greeting, I'll see you next year or something. So the people had, had good feelings for Shari Tikva, but unfortunately they would live far away and they, they couldn't come regularly. The neighborhood was changing and the synagogue, the life of the synagogue really wasn't the same. The people, wonderful, beautiful people, but fewer all the time. The original members got older, the children got married, moved out, and, and little by little you could see the, the, the older people want to be with their kids, so they, they kind of move out where the kids are. Finally, it became too expensive to operate the complex at Kimball and Ardmore. It was sold in 2010, and the congregation moved into a second-floor space in an office building at 3500 West Peterson. It would be Sheratikva B'nai Zion's last home. Rabbi Dennis Katz died in February 2011. The still shrinking Sheratikva membership looked at its options. A management consultant was even brought in to help. When our rabbi died, Dennis Katz died. He was only 64 years old when he passed away. Um, we thought we could go on and we tried to hire a new rabbi, a young man, but in our mind, really nobody could compare to Dennis. And I think we just wound came up with the conclusion that we're just too many, to, too few to go on. We didn't have enough people to have the critical mass necessary to sustain a uh, synagogue uh, in the way that we, we used to have. The conservative movement has changed dramatically over the last 20 years. There are very few large conservative synagogues left. With annual deficits exceeding $200,000, and no hope for new membership, no viable merger options, the final decision to close was made. The board of directors gave the huge task of carrying it out to Todd Bodenstein and Brad Fisher. It's either going to be a large group of people that will be interested in dealing with it or no one will want to deal with it and it'll fall to one or two people to have to kind of do it unilaterally. I think many of us felt we were in, we were in uncharted waters. And, uh, you know, there, there isn't a, 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 a guidebook uh, on, that I'm aware of on uh, how you close down uh, a congregation that's been in existence for, for a century. Help in making decisions facing the membership and the board of directors was not to be found in the Shara Tikva B'nai Zion Library or in any other Jewish library. The old adage, uh, two Jews, three opinions, really comes here where there will definitely be opinions of people, what people think are the right thing to do and the wrong thing to do, and you have to listen to everyone and try to make the best decision. You know, we had uh, to think, you know, very, very thoughtfully about uh, how that was going to take place, and, you know, part of that thinking led to, you know, really wanting to put some efforts towards uh, preserving the legacy of the congregation. Um, we talked with different organizations, uh, Spurtis, the Chicago Jewish Historical Society, um, a number of, um, you know, efforts were, um, you know, discussed and, and initiated. Small or medium term things, the board usually is able to make decisions, but in the decision of giving away or disposing of your, most of your assets, whether physical or financial, the membership has to make the final decision. When I say disposed of, I mean figuring out who's going to get them, contacting members to find out that they want their memorial plaques, and then facilitating them, getting their memorial plaques, 
Right now we have two giant storage facilities that we're renting at a fairly substantial cost monthly to keep all these items in so that we can systematically get them to the right people, whether it be former members or other organizations that could use these objects. For Dr. Linda Gruenberg, the decision to close forever was deja vu. She had been on the board at B'nai Zion when the doors closed permanently there. A board represents the congregation. The congregation may not agree with it. At a, at a general board meeting, you may have congregants that vote against doing that. In terms of Illinois and probably other states, the, um, the states have requirements for nonprofits to, to shut down. There are legal requirements and legal uh, decisions that have to be made. And for the most part, it's a membership decision for the synagogues, for anything that's a substantial financial impact. I would say after going through this a few times that it's very important not to wait to the last minute. It's very important not to wait until you don't have many choices. Do we want to just continue until the last dollar is gone or do we want to be a little bit more proactive and look at a number of things like where will our current members find, uh, you know, find their future congregation. Uh, you know, is there something that we could do with our remaining funds that would um, be beneficial to the greater Jewish community? It was an extremely difficult decision to, uh, close, the, to close down the synagogue, to essentially terminate the synagogue. I did not want it to happen. Um, I was angry. I was sad, but I understood we only had 27, 27, 28 families left. In the end, uh, we ended up supporting, you know, a number of uh, congregations and Jewish institutions in Chicago. And, you know, at this point, most of our members have found new synagogues where they're happy. And, you know, ultimately, I, I think that was the, the best thing to do, because if we had just continued on for another couple of years, you know, we would have, we would have uh, run out of money, and there w would have been no time, or or there would have been no resources to put towards uh, these these efforts. Jack Reese remembers fondly, sadly, the final service at Shera Tikva B'nai Zion. Well, it was a Shabbat morning. Just saying goodbye to people, knowing that that was the last service we were going to be having together, was very. It was uh, kind of heart-wrenching. Uh, I know a lot of people were very sad. I was sad. And yet, during the service itself, there was a lot of, a lot of, uh, we'll call it ruach, much more per participation than, than uh, we sometimes would get on a Saturday morning. So it was uh, very bittersweet. One of the Jewish institutions receiving assets from Shera Tikva B'nai Zion is three-year-old Mishkan, Chicago. This is a Shabbos service on August 3rd, 2013. The rabbi and founder of Mishkan, Chicago is Lizzie Hademan. We were attracting a ton of young adults in the city and people who would not otherwise have been involved in the Jewish community, but we didn't have our own Torah. But on this Shabbos morning, Shera Tikva B'nai Zion gave three of its Torahs to Mishkan, Chicago. Several Shera Tikva B'nai Zion members were there as Irving Fetterman made the presentation. Things are beshared sometimes, you know, they just, they just happen sometimes, you know. And uh, there's a, uh, a phrase that says, well, there, every cloud has a silver lining. So yes, you can look at this as these synagogues passing these Torahs as a gift to Mishkan, but really, the greater gift, I think, when I thought about this, is the gift that you're giving to us, that you've formed a congregation, a vibrant congregation that has energy, that has vitality, that has a great hope for the future. And the gift to us is that it gives us a, a sense of joy in our closing, in our ending, which is so sad, to be able to transfer these, pass these Torahs to you, gives us such a sense of joy that, to know that this is going to continue. We're comforted by this, and the Jewish community in Chicago 
a mazel tov for you for letting us give you these Torahs. It's an incredible honor. It's been amazing to have members of Shari Tikva B'nai Zion continue to join us at services, not just to be there on the day when they handed the Torah to us and when Irv spoke so beautifully about what it means to, yes, close the doors on your shul, but also know that there's somebody who's taking that energy and taking your, taking your Torah, your teaching, your wisdom, um, your experience, and, and carrying it forth into the next generation.